Okay, guys, so last week we spoke about um, your salvation, being born again, and we saw that Yeshua said that the next step is to have yourself baptized. So I think there's a huge misconception, especially under believers, that um, baptism is a New Testament thing. And I think what we're going to aim tonight at doing, Natanya and myself, is we're going to show you that baptism is something that's been there since the Old Testament. It's been there for quite long. And we're also going to look at some misconceptions about uh, baptism. And we're going to talk about two specific baptisms. We're going to speak about the water baptism. And we're going to speak about the baptism by fire or the baptism by the Holy Spirit. Right at the end, if there's anyone that hasn't been baptized by the Holy Spirit yet, we're going to get my mom to pray for us. And uh, But what I just want to say is if we look at the picture of what happened in Acts 2, we see that Yeshua told his okay someone's not muted if you could just there we go thank you so um we're gonna get my mom to pray and what you'll see is that in acts 2 yeshua told the disciples to go and wait in jerusalem and there was a specific time when the holy spirit came upon them so i want to encourage you if the baptism of the holy spirit is something that hasn't happened to you yet and there has been prayer for you Sometimes we just need to wait. Sometimes there's a timing thing related to it, but we're going to talk about it. So first, let's look at the scriptural references, and you're welcome to make your own notes. I will also post the notes on the group as I did last week. So in Matthew 3, verse 11, we see John the Baptist speaking, and he says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So that's our scriptural reference for the baptism with water and the baptism by fire. We also see in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, and that's what we read last week. It's Yeshua saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So just three things I want to highlight here. We see that God say, uh, Yeshua says that we need to go out and make disciples. He says that we need to baptize them in water and in the, uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we see the baptism of the Holy Spirit there. And it also says, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. So in the weeks to follow, we're also going to speak about what did, what did Yeshua command us to do? Because I think a lot of people stop with the baptism. Uh, but we see it's very important to him that we know what he commands us to do and that we stay obedient to that. And we need to teach that because you, if you're new to the faith, how will you know if someone's not teaching you? So before I give over to Natanya, um, uh, on the note, you'll see when I post it later, she also put a beautiful picture in there for us of a traditional baptism pool that you would find in Jerusalem uh, near the temple, I believe. And then... Um, the, the, the question that a lot of people have is when do you do the baptism of repentance? So Natanya is going to talk about the different types of water baptism that you have. And yes, you heard me correctly. There are different types of water baptism. So I think a lot of people also think there's just that one water baptism and then you're done. But that one water baptism that everyone does, that's the water baptism of repentance. That's what you do when you become born again. And it's symbolic of dying to the old nature, dying to sin, dying to yourself, and being resurrected in Yeshua. But Natanya is going to explain that very nicely to us. So when you get your water baptism of repentance is when you become born again. Okay. Um, there's no verse that says that you should also only do this baptism once. I mean, we don't sin once and then, you know, we never sin again. We all fall short of the glory of God. So even in our walk of righteousness, there may be times where we backslide a little or we really drop the ball and we commit a terrible sin. And we can still then do the baptism of repentance again. 
as a symbol of uh, us dying to that old sinful nature and being washed clean of that sin. So I just want to make sure that you also understand that the baptism with uh, of repentance is, is done when you're born again, but you can do it again and again and again as you feel the need, as you feel the need to have the defilement of sin uh, being washed away. Okay, so I'm going to give over to Natanya because she's going to do the teaching on the baptism by water for us. Okay, so I first want to start off with a little bit of a language lesson because the first time we find the word for baptism in the scriptures is in Genesis and it's called a mikvah in Hebrew. That's the first word or the first time we see this occurrence of something being completely immersed in water. And that's actually the direct translation to English is immersion. You are immersed completely. So I'm going to look at a few times we see this immersion happening and then we'll end up with uh, Yeshua's mikvah or baptism in the New Testament. Just to show you that this is a pattern that has been repeating from Genesis 1 all the way through and that you have an understanding whenever the word repeats itself, it's trying to put emphasis on this thing as being important or these events all pointing to each other and all having something to do with each other. And so it's very important that we um, make sure that we uh, see these little patterns and that we then make our own assumptions from it. You can make a little study of it yourself. And I just quickly want to say again for the people that are new or popping in as we go on, we are recording and we would please appreciate it if you guys just mute yourselves. So that the, the sounds, the background sounds are not transferred onto the recording feed. Okay, so I'm going to start with the first occurrence is in Genesis 1, verses 1 to 2. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was unformed and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. And then God said, let there be light. So we see in Genesis 1, 1, the, the spirit of God is hovering on this water. And what happens later on in verses 9 to 10, we're still in Genesis 1, it says, and God said, this is on the third day of creation, by the way. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered together into one space and let dry land appear. And that is the first mikvah that takes place, is the earth was mikvah before creation. And from under, the, um, the earth was immersed under the water and it was lifted up out of the water. And that was a cleansing that took place. We also know, like Alzheimer's said, whenever something's reborn, or when so sometime, uh, sometimes people mikvah when they go into a different spiritual um, season, they also mikvah. And this is what happened. It was a mikvah of new beginnings that took place. The second occurrence of the mikvah is in Exodus 14 verses 21 to 22, where the people of Israel were mikvah as they left Egypt we see that the sea parted for them and they walked through the water into the wilderness. And that's the second occurrence of a mikvah that we see. The third occurrence is in Joshua 3, when the people of Israel leave the desert or the wilderness and they go through the Jordan and the Jordan split the same way that, um, that the Red Sea split. It opened and they walked through. And so we see this pattern of immersing and then walking through the water or under the water. These are all mikvahs. And then the fourth occurrence is in Leviticus 22 verses 6 to 7. And this speaks of whenever someone became unclean. And um, if you don't know what unclean is, we'll at some stage do a, a study on that if you want. But whenever you um, touch something or get into contact with something that is unclean, you are no longer allowed to go to the temple to do sacrifices or to go to do temple worship. So you first had to go through these baths, these mikvahs, and become clean before you can go into the temple. And so we see that they are also very specific about it, that it, whatever needs to be cleaned needs to be fully Im immersed. And you went alone, you did it by yourself. It was a very private thing. And what happened is the person would go into these water baths or these mikvah baths, and they would bend their knees, and as they bent their knees, if you walk into the mikvah bath, maybe I should say this first, and that's why I put the picture in. 
they had these steps that went down into the bath and the water was exactly at a level that when a person would walk in and bend their knee that the water level will rise and there was in a little um, drain that went out that carried the water out. So if someone was physically dirty and the, the dirt would come off of them, it would have been washed away from this water. And this symbolized also that if you if you t went into the water defiled by something, whenever you come out after your immersion, whatever defiled you was washed away. And so it was very important that the water was moving water in which they mikvah. And we see the first three occur uh, occurrences of a mikvah also. It was moving water. It was water that, well, it wasn't stagnant water like we are used to sort of a bath type of thing. It was moving water. The next one we want to look at is Mark 1 verses 48. And this is the baptism of Yeshua. Uh, it's Mark 1 verses 48. It's first, first speak of John the Immerser and how he was preaching to people to repent and ask for forgiveness of their sins. And then they were back, baptized in the Jordan River, which is our third place of uh, Mikvah that we see in the Word. And then after that, they were clean and they were then, um, he said, but the I will make by you in water, but the one that comes after me will make by you in the Holy Spirit. And then we see Yeshua's baptism where it says that John the immersed and then baptized him and that's in Mark 1 verses 9 to 12. And so I think what's important that you need to realize about the Mikvah, and as you can see here, is it happened quite often. Right, it's not something that a person did only once, um, but it is quite important. So I'm going to read through a few things that people did uh, that has a, con a connection with the mikvah. So the first one is, if, if anyone becomes unclean, they would do a mikvah or impure or defiled by something. You would do a mikvah, and one of the things that was physic a physical thing that would make you in is touching a dead body of a person. Uh, so that was one of the things that would make them impure. Another thing is before any festivals that you find in the word of God, they also would do a mikvah and clean themselves in order to take part in the holiness of the festival. Any uh, purifying of the body that needed to take place due to defilement. Another one, is that Jewish girls and boys, or men and women actually, I should rather say, before they get married, they also do a mikvah. And this is quite symbolic. So the women would do a mikvah with the women and the men would do the, it with the man. And what would happen is as the girl went into the water, she went into the water under the covering of her father. But the, And this, this she would do the night before her wedding. And when she stood up out of the water, it symbolizes that she now goes under the covering of her husband. So it's a seasonal change that takes place for her. And another thing that people would do is when they would mikvah, they would mikvah in the teacher's teaching. So whenever someone did a, or followed a, a rabbi or a teacher like Yeshua was in the word, they would baptize people, they would lick for people, because this would imply that you are following your teachers' teachings and commandments. And uh, what they would say then in those moments, as you meet for and you come up out of the water, you take up the yoke of your teacher. That was part of the of the mikvah ceremony when you had a teacher. And so when John the Baptist was baptizing people in his teaching and instruction he would um, that he received from Messiah, all these people were making covenants and taking up Messiah's yoke and teachings and commandments. That is what the mikvah symbolized. So it also symbolized the forgiveness of sin and standing up reborn and born again. But it additionally would yoke you into the teaching and the commandments of Messiah or your teacher. And then, so this is why John Mikvah people, it wasn't only to get them to repent of their sin and to, to be clean,
but it was also to yoke them into the teaching and the beliefs of Messiah. Okay, so, thank you, Natanya. Oh, are you done? No, I just wanted to say, so you are going to do the baptism by fire for us now. Um, do you mind if I just comment two or three things on the water baptism? Um, what I think is important to understand is um, that you don't have to get someone to do this for you. It was facilitated in Jerusalem. So there was someone that stood at the bath that would say, okay, you enter now, you walk through and you go out. But this idea of someone putting their hand on your head and dunking you under the water, that's not scriptural. And that's, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that's not how it was done in the Bible times. So you, it's nice and good and advisable to have a witness there um, because it is, like Natanya said, it's a covenant. So I've done a, a few mikvahs where uh, when I still had a house with a swimming pool because we didn't have running, uh, you know, living water, water that was moving. But I would just stand next to the side and we would pray. And then the person themselves would pray and make a dedication and declare, this is why I'm doing this mikvah. And they would go under the water themselves and come up by themselves. So this is a very personal, intimate thing between you and God. It's not something that you need someone else to put your head under the water necessarily. And that's also not what John did. When we see that John baptized people, he wasn't standing there dunking a thousand people a day in the Jordan River. He was facilitating it. So he was bringing a message and he was telling them, you, you know, you enter the side and you go out that way. So I just wanted to um, also... I just mention that because I think there is some misunderstanding and I'm not saying that if you have been baptized in the traditional way with someone dunking you under the water that it's ungodly or wrong it is still right that's fine but if you can't get someone to do that for you just remember that the the scriptural references we have no one had to dunk your head under the water it's something you could do yourself okay I also um, sometimes get my clients if they People that go through a change, I've unfortunately, and it's always so sad um, when people get divorced, but when you get divorced, I tell my clients to get a mik to mikvah, to get out under the authority of that husband or that wife and that covenant and, and you know, resurrect to something new. If you've gone through a trauma, if there's a change of season, even if you start a new job, you're entering out of that authority of the old company or boss or whatever you submitted under into a new one, changing of ministry. So can you see the practical examples of when you would do a mikvah? It's when something changes in your life. So it signifies either a dying off or a changing or a starting of something new. Okay, so... The baptism by fire or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to take you right back to where Natanya took us, and that's to Genesis. Um, and there's no better way. I keep on saying this, guys. There's no better place to start to read the Bible than in Genesis. Um, so in Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we see the Spirit of God being there right at the beginning. And I, I think we also have a misconception that the Spirit of God only showed up after Yeshua died and when, you know, he, he went to heaven. That's when the Spirit started moving. But we see that the Spirit of God has been moving um, since the beginning of creation. Um, there's an excellent teaching that a lady does, uh, Dr. Elisa Alavan. It's called the Creation Gospel. And you can take every day of creation and it tells the story of the gospel of Yeshua. And even this tells the story of you and me. If you think of where we started last week, um, sometimes our lives are formless and void. Our lives are dark. There's confusion. And what happens is that the Spirit of God starts hovering over us. And it's the Spirit of God, I think Daniel Leone mentioned it, that's what prompts you to, to have that feeling of, I need to change, I want to become born again. It starts with the Spirit. So the Spirit has been there from the very beginning. 
Today I want to speak about the two ways that we can see the spirit represented in the word and the one is that he's often represented as wind or as fire and the first place we we see this reference as, as the Holy Spirit um, of the Holy Spirit as wind is the hovering over the waters okay so that's the how we know that he represents wind we also see a lot of uh, reference with breath and the ruach so in hebrew the root word for breath for ruach uh, actually for smell that uh, implies you know taking in air through your nose and ruach is very very similar so we can see that breath and the holy spirit there's a link to that as well we know that there's often reference to the holy spirit in the bible as a bird uh, the Holy Spirit came down on Yeshua as a dove. And how does a bird fly? By flapping its wings. And it's the wind and the wind currents and the resistance with the wind that helps the bird to fly. So we can even see in that the reference to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also represented as fire. And we're going to talk about the fire on Mount Sinai because that's the first time we see the baptism by fire with the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit was also what put that burning bush, what lighted up the burning bush that Moses saw um, you know, while he was tending the sheep. Uh, we see the seven lamp menorah in the tabernacle and the seven lamps of the menorah represent the seven spirits of god and again that lamp burned with fire and that represents the holy spirit and then we've got the tongues of fire on the heads of the disciples in acts 2 when they were baptized by the holy spirit so those are just a, a few quick examples of um, fire and the relation to the Holy Spirit. But as we continue with the study, I want you to just remember that the Holy Spirit has been around since the very beginning. Okay, so where do we see the first baptism by fire in the Bible? And it, we see it with a very special feast. Now, we'll get to the feasts as well. Those of you who were here last week know that we decided to really start at the foundation and build upwards. Um, so I'm just going to talk very quickly about the Feast of Shavuot because the Feast of Shavuot is commonly known as Pentecost. Uh, uh, you know, the, the church will call it Pentecost. It's the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but it is actually the Feast of Shavuot. And we find the Feast of Shavuot in the first five books of the Bible. That's called the Torah. So Shavuot is the first place, or Pentecost, is at Mount Sinai, and that's in Exodus 19, verse 18, where we see that now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. So there we see the Lord baptized that entire mountain in the fire of the Holy Spirit. So um, when you look at the notes, you're also going to see I did it two little columns as a comparison. So I'm going to read um, Exodus 19, verse 16 to 19, and then we're going to look at Acts 2, verse 1 to 4. And I want you to note the similarities between these two outpourings of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, we see so much symbolism and prophetic word that is um, fulfilled in the New Testament. And one of the things that we sometimes get wrong as Greek-minded believers is that we want something to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. We like it when things work like that. But our God doesn't work like that. He comes from a Hebrew perspective, and the Hebrew perspective works in cycles. So the, it's like a circle. Where does a circle end and where does it begin and where is the middle? You, you can't find it. So it, it's, it's a cycle. And that's the way biblical prophecy works as well. It's a cycle. So we have biblical prophecy being fulfilled over and over and over again. It doesn't just get fulfilled once. That's why we can get to the end of Revelation and it says that the Lamb was slain before the beginning of the foundation of the world. Can you see how the end of the book takes us right back to the beginning of the book? There is no beginning and there is no end. It all works in cycles. 
Okay, so Exodus 19 verse 16 to 19 says, On the morning of the third day, there was thunder, lightning, and a thick cloud on the mountain. The shofar blast sounded loudly, so loudly that all the people in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They stood near the base of the mountain. Mount Sinai was enveloped in smoke because Adonai descended onto it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with a voice. Then in Acts 2 verse 1 to 4, we see the festival of Shavuot. And like I said, the festival of Shavuot is linked to the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. So can you see the relation here? We, we end the same time. And for God, times and seasons are very important. So at the same time that God descended on the mountain in fire, we see that it's the Feast of Shavuot again in Acts 2. And it says, and the believers all gather together in one place. And that's a commandment, if you were wondering, with the feasts, God commands us to gather together as a congregation. Suddenly there came a sound from the sky, like the roar of a violent wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire, which separated and came to rest on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in different languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. So what's interesting is, and you know, we're all from different countries, but every country has got their own folklore, right? You've got those stories of old and they usually have some kind of lesson that they're teaching us or something that we learn from them. And in the same way, the Jews have folklore, they've got stories that they use, and some of them may, them may be related to truth, and some of them may be made up, but it's the lesson that, that they're trying to teach us that we should focus on. So rabbinic commentary and um, this, the folklore of the Jewish people say that when God descended on the mountain uh, in, at Mount Sinai, that the sound of his voice, when he spoke the Ten Commandments, each person there could hear it in their own language. So, um, you know, when we read about them coming out of Egypt, we see that it's a mixed multitude that comes out of Egypt. So at that time, Egypt had a lot of different countries, people that were enslaved there. It wasn't only the Israelites that were enslaved there. There were people from other countries as well. And God allowed anyone that wanted to go with the Israelites, that were willing to make the sacrifice of the lamb and eat the Passover meal and choose the God of Israel. He allowed them to go with him. So when they ended up at the foot of Mount Sinai, they, they didn't all speak the same language. And it also says there, uh, later on, we find a reference that says that God even made a covenant with those that were not there that day. And when, when he spoke the Ten Commandments, he spoke it in every, every person heard it in their own language. So he didn't speak it over and over again in different languages. The miracle was the fact that he spoke once but everyone heard and understood it in their own language. And that's what makes this miracle in Acts 2 so amazing, because we see a repeat of that. We see that the disciples, when they are baptized by the fire of the Holy Spirit, they share the gospel and the miracles in this heavenly language. But the miracle is that everyone hears it in their own language. And I've had amazing testimonies that I've read of this phenomenon. What I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to post a teaching for you on the group because it's going to be two weeks before we meet again. So you've got two weeks to listen to this. It's a, a teaching that Jim Staley did on tongues, on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it's very good. I encourage you to listen to it. Um, and But he speaks also of, of an example. And... I've heard it once where this guy was in an airplane and he's sitting and it's quite a long flight and he's reading his Bible and he, he feels the Holy Spirit say to him, start praying in your heavenly tongue, but pray aloud. 
Now he's he's telling the story and he says in his mind he's thinking, Lord, these people are gonna think I'm crazy. And he doesn't do it. And a few minutes later, he feels the prompting of the Holy Spirit again saying, speak in your heavenly tongue, but speak it aloud. And it's like, Lord, really? Now? And then, um, oh, someone needs to mute themselves, sorry. And then uh, eventually he felt so pressed by the Holy Spirit and he felt so guilty at not being obedient. So he says, softly, he started praying in his tongue. He was so scared someone would hear. And the Lord says louder and he starts praying a little bit louder and the Lord says louder and he starts praying louder. and eventually he's speaking aloud and he thinks, well, people must think I'm crazy now. And this guy next to him, like I'm getting goosebumps, I love this story. This guy next to him was from an African country and he starts crying, but the tears are just running and running and running down his face. And eventually this guy looks at him and he's like, what's going on? And he was sharing the gospel to that man in his own language in the most beautiful way. Because remember, now your soul is not involved with the sharing of the gospel. It's purely God's spirit. And God knew exactly what that man needed to hear. And I just think it's such a beautiful story. And that's the miracle of tongues. It's not that we are speaking in a different language. The miracle is the miracle of hearing. You can be speaking your heavenly tongue and it's the same thing to you that you're saying over and over again, but God works that miracle where someone else needs to hear that. And it's not your flesh that's interfering with the message that they need to hear. It's purely God's spirit. All he needs is your obedience. And that's the miracle that the rabbis speak of that happened at Mount Sinai. Everyone heard what they needed to hear in their language. And that's what happened in Acts 2. We see that when we speak in tongues, it's God, God's spirit praying through us. So it's God speaking through us. When it was on the mountain, it was God speaking and people were listening. The miracle that took place once Yeshua died was that now God can also speak his word through us, through the ministry of speaking in tongues. And at the mountain, what they wanted to do, they just wanted to run away. This was so scary. But in Acts, we see that it, the speaking of tongues becomes an intimacy between you and God. It's not anymore, I want to run away from you, Lord. It becomes something where I am speaking from my spirit to your spirit. And there's an intimacy that takes place. And we see in Acts that God communicates his will through his commandments. But once we are filled with the Holy Spirit, he allows us to pray his will in the spirit. Because like I said, when we pray in tongues, we are not praying a soulish prayer because you don't know what you're praying. It's God's Holy Spirit praying to you. You can only pray his will. So how will you know if you've been baptized with the fire of the Holy Spirit? Um, you will speak in a heavenly tongue. And you can hear, listen, guys, there's such a big thing in the occultic movement and in the New Age movement with the Kundalini spirit that tries to mimic the Holy Spirit. And I promise you, if, if the spirit of God is in you, you will discern if someone is speaking in a heavenly tongue or in a demonic tongue. Um, so you will know by the fact that you will be speaking in a tongue. And there's the miracle of hearing. So sometimes, especially in a congregation, that's what Paul said. Don't just all speak in tongues when you're in a congregation. You're not helping anyone because no one understands what you're saying. This is actually something that you do between you and God. But if there's a tongue that is spoken in a congregation, there must be someone that can lay out the tongue, that can give the meaning. Because that edifies the congregation. And there was another story that I want to tell you of um, one gentleman that went to a church and the Holy Spirit fell. And in this specific church, they were against the speaking of tongues. So the pastor never taught about tongues and the Holy Spirit and, um, and the Holy Spirit fell. And this guy got up and he walked to the pulpit and he spoke in tongues. 
And then this husband and wife are driving home and the wife is very offended. She says to her husband, can you believe the pastor allowed that man to do that in front of the whole congregation? And now she's just going on yuck, yuck, yuck. And the husband looks at her and he says, that was the most beautiful prayer that I've ever heard. And so what happened was he had the interpretation, but because he was never taught that there could be something like someone speaking in tongues and you the one that hears and has the interpretation and you need to share it with the congregation to bless them. He didn't do that. So the whole congregation missed out on that blessing. Okay, so um, misconceptions about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I think one of the two of the things that I've heard that that really shocked me every time I hear it is that some some con some really that's a nice way to say that some churches you know each church has some denominations teach that if you do not speak in tongues you are not saved that is not true your salvation has got nothing to do with your ability to speak in tongues jesus died on the cross you are saved done there is nothing else to salvation so if you cannot speak in tongues, it does not mean that you are not saved. Another misconception is that if you cannot speak in tongues, you're not a good Christian or you don't have a good relationship with God, which is also not true because we see the Bible says um, that the speaking of tongues falls under the gifts of the spirit. But we see there's something called the fruit of the spirit. OK, so that should not be confused. We should all be bearers of fruit. We should all have the fruit of the spirit. And whatever's missing in your life, you should work on until you have it. We, if you're a good Christian, a good believer, you will have the fruit of the spirit. If you're a good Christian and a good believer, you may not speak in tongues. Or it might take a while for you to get it because it's a gift. It's not a given. Okay. So please don't feel condemned if you're sitting here and you've been trusting the Lord for a while and people have prayed for you and you haven't had the gift of tongues yet. Sometimes it's just a timing issue, but it's a gift that God bestows on us. It does not make you a good or a bad believer. Okay, so that's all I wanted to share. I wondered if my mom would like to share how my brother was Oh, I want to add to your things. Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so the first thing in Exodus 19, the sages say that um, when God spoke from the mountain, we see that the, the scripture in Ex Exodus 19 describes it as the whole mountain shook. And so what happened is there was a physical energy that was dispersed from the mountain and God's voice that went out. It was an energy that was created. And we know anyone that studies science, energy cannot be created and energy cannot be destroyed but it can move from one form to another and what they say is the voice of god that spoke of the mountain is energy it cannot be destroyed and so god's voice is still vibrating in each person's lifetime waiting for them to open their ears to hear the Ten Commandments, to hear Him speaking to them. The next thing I want to say is on the mountain, um, when God spoke, the people became so overwhelmed and scared that they said to Moses, no, please, you go speak to God. We cannot endure this again. And that was the people rejecting intimacy with God. He was willing to have intimacy with them, to speak to all of them. And they rejected it because of fear. And we see that in Acts, people accepting having that intimacy with God and um, in a personal ma manner. So that's also something. And then the last thing I want to say is that when we are mikvah or baptized by water, that cleans your body. But when you are baptized by fire, like when God spoke of the mountain, I'm not talking about speaking in tongues. I'm speaking of God's Holy Spirit coming upon you in any forms of the gifts of the Spirit. That cleanses your spirit. Because water cannot cleanse a spirit. Only fire can cleanse a spirit. And that's what we also see with Noah. 
when God came to judge the world with Noah, they were judged with water and they, the earth. Oh, that's one that I actually missed. Uh, that was also a baptism by water. Thank you, Tani Leone. Um, it was also a baptism why water was, was Noah and that the whole earth was covered by water. And then God said, but I will not come and judge you like that again. Next time I'll judge you by fire. And that will be to cleanse our spirits. Okay, that's all I wanted to add. Okay, so I'm, I would like my mom to share um, the story of my brother. Now he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then mom, will you pray for everyone that's here that maybe is still trusting the Lord for the gift of tongues? Since we've got the corporate anointing now, please. Yes, I also want to say something first about the baptism. Natanya, you mentioned it, that when, when um, a young lady is getting married to a husband, the night before the wedding, she's going through a mikvah that symbolizes, it's a prophetic act, that she's coming out under the authority of her earthly father and she's going under the authority of a new husband. And when we accept Yeshua as our Lord and Savior, when we are baptized or mikvat, um, the, baptize, um, the baptism um, symbolism of that is when I go under the water, um, I come out of the authority of the God of this world. And we know that the God of this world is Satan. So when we go under the water, we lay down all of the world and we coming out of the water under a new authority, under the, the authority of Yahweh Elohim. And I want to, to um, explain to you how powerful a, back, a baptism or a mikvah can be. I once ministered to a lady and um, she was a witch. And she was molested and raped and everything you can think of. And she came to the Lord and she was baptized already. And at that moment, she was in ministry already. But she came to me for deliverance and inner healing and stuff. And um, I, I prayed with her about the rape and the, everything that happened to her. And the next day she came back and she said, but Alma, um, it doesn't feel if anything lifted off me. And I said to her, but let's baptize you. Let's mikvah you. And we had this, a, a swimming bath at our or swimming pool at our home. And we walk outside to go and to mikvah her. And when she put her feet into the water, the enemy was screaming out of her. And her whole head but bowed backwards to her thighs, I want to say. And that thing was so manifesting, afraid of this woman doing this mikvah. So it shows you the power of baptism. It shows you the power of mikvah. A guy once phoned me or someone phoned me. They wanted me to see this guy. And um, I asked, so what is the story? And they told me he was serving God for a whole year and he was in a certain church. But he got very sore in the church. Someone um, totally, it was like devastation to him. And he decided, but I'm not going to follow God anymore. Now I'm going to become a Satanist. And um, he was in Satanism for a whole year. And he was speaking to his high priest and he asked his high priest, why don't I got, um, got ranking in the satanic orders? I did all the sacrifices. I did everything that they asked of me. And then the high priest asked him this question, were you baptized? Because there is a grave in the spirit testifying against you. And you cannot grow in the satanic orders if you are baptized. And that turned that guy's whole life back to the Lord. So can you see how powerful the baptism and mikvah is? And as 
Natanya said, is not the once off story. Um, you can mikvah every time that you feel the fault or, or something happened in the week or whatever. Okay, um, about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, my son, I think he was 12 or 13 years old and he was sleeping at night and he was speaking it in tongues, waking himself up, speaking in this heavenly language. So I think one or other time, because they belong to a youth group, he asked God for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Didn't receive it right off, but receive it in his sleep. So God work in mysterious ways. Don't think if we pray now, you have to speak in tongues now. You can. Yes, God can do it. And he, most of the time he is doing it. But if it is not happening right off, don't lose hope. Ask him for that. And I want to tell you, to speak in tongues is a powerful, powerful weapon. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the sign that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. But I also want to say, like our Zahn said, if you are not speaking in tongues, it doesn't diminish your salvation in any way. So I think my opinion is that the moment that you are born again, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's just um, the only thing that has to happen is that you can set that spirit free, free. And that is sometimes difficult for our Greek mindset because we want to, um, what is the word now? Think it out. Yes, and, and you cannot, because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not in your head. It's here in your spirit. It's from the belly that living waters will flow through you. And um, so let's pray for everyone that is on this group that is not baptized in the Holy Spirit, that we as a group is going to trust God. You know, his word says, if you ask me a bread, I will not give you a stone. If you ask me a fish, I will not give you a snake. And we ask God for the Holy Spirit. And that is what he will give us. So let's close our eyes and, uh, eyes and let's pray. Father, in the name of Yeshua, we want to thank you. Thank you that you saved us. Thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit. To, um, to lead us to you. You came for us. We didn't seek you. You seek us, Father. And we want to thank you for that. And Father, the work that you have begun in us, you will finish it. And part of the finishing of the work in us is that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you will help us to release the Holy Spirit within us and father in the name of yeshua i pray now for everyone that is not baptized in your spirit that you will come yeshua because you are the baptizer of the holy spirit according to john and i ask you father that the fire of the holy spirit will be on every child on everyone in this group and even on the extended family father that you will baptize us in your holy spirit that your fire will be upon us and that your fire will come out of our spirit father so that you will empower us to be witnesses unto your kingdom in yeshua's name and we thank you for that Amen. Please feel free to leave a comment. If you like this video, click the like button. Remember to subscribe to our channel and don't forget to ring the bell.